Hi, and welcome to the Decision Wise Engaging People podcast. My name is Charles Rogel. I work as the Vice President of Consulting here at Decision Wise. I'm joined today by our presenter, our president, Matt Ride. Hi, Charles. Good to be with you. Welcome. And uh, today our topic is on psychological safety, how a manager can create more psychologically safe workplace and what it really means in today's workplace, as well as how to kind of think about the behaviors that drive psychological safety within a team. So Matt, do you want to set us up by talking about kind of how we define this yeah. term? Yeah, there's no universal definition for psychological safety. We do know it's a theme that's important in the workplace. In other words, it's an element of the employee experience that needs to be nurtured and it mm-hmm. needs to be built. So that's why it's important to us here at Decision Wise. You cannot skip over psychological safety as part of your employee experience. As I said, there's no universal definition. Sometimes it's the ability to speak up without fear of retribution. Sometimes it's that you can take actions without fear of negative consequences from your team members. And I'll share here in a second a little bit of a personal anecdote that I really think goes to the heart of psychological safety. But in essence, it's this notion that I can be my authentic self and I can take risks without having it bite me right. and come back to haunt me. Uh-huh. So. Yeah, so there's some history behind this term. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in the 1960s, researchers Shine and Bennis set out to talk about what we would call the precursor to what we now know as psychological safety. And then in Deming, the, you know, the famous management guru, yeah. the, the one that was so heavily involved with Toyota and everything, he talked about it as a fundamental management principle, the need to drive out fear. And I'm going to come back to that later because I really believe that that's a great way to think about it conceptually is yeah. you drive out fear and then you allow people a space to bring their best selves to work. So he was at that early in the 70s and 80s. One interesting example I think about him is installing the, the buttons on the manufacturing assembly line to stop the line. Like all employees had the power now to stop the line if they saw a mistake which was unheard of in the time. Right. And, and you were fearful for screwing up and you just let mistakes fly by because you didn't want to stop the line and be that guy. There's a great story where Toyota had a shared plant with a domestic manufacturer. Yeah. They had installed those. Mm-hmm. And a Japanese executive is touring this plant and there is an American worker just falling behind having problems. He's like, push the button. It's mm-hmm. okay. It's like, oh, no, no, I got this. Push the button. It's okay. Finally went up took the the worker's hand, helped him push the button. He said, look, I'm sorry we put you in a position to fail, but that's a principle of of creating psychological safety. He didn't ring him out. He said, I'm sorry that you're here, but stop the process. Be willing to stop it. The outcome is more important Mm -hmm. than, yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of a famous story that comes out of Deming's work. Yeah, you're right on. In the 90s, uh, William Kahn wrote writing in the Academy of Management journal, he talked about the psychological conditions of personal engagement and disengagement at work. So he starts to really bring in the psychology of it. And then eventually Amy Edmondson, a Harvard professor of leadership in 1999, she's the one who full on tackles the subject, makes it a leadership competency and is the one who actually has my favorite definition of it, which is that psychological safety is defined as a shared belief held by members of a team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. It's not just being extroverted and speaking up and all that. It's that you can take risks. I told you I'd share with you an anecdote about this. I remember working for Nancy Hadley in Seattle. She was my great manager when I was with Deloitte. And I remember as she came to us one time and she sent us all home at about 1130. She said, you're no good to me. You'll make more mistakes. <laughs> I want to see you back here at six o'clock. But this notion of pulling an all-nighter, she said it was just going to cause more problems. And she's the same one that would every once in a while say, it's okay to take a mental health day. Now, back then, we all felt like we had to hide it or right. you know, now we can sort of speak up and say, look, I'm, I need a day to recharge so that I can give my best effort mm-hmm. the following 10 days. But before then, we didn't have that. Now, she taught me the importance of psychological safety, and now I see it everywhere where it's permissible for someone to raise their hand and say, hey, I want to recharge, and I'll see you guys in a day. And everybody's like, okay, this is good. Anyway, that's kind of the history of how psychological safety has come about. And again, I've landed on this notion that it's when team members feel safe to take risks and be vulnerable in front of each other. 
That's the leadership competency that we now have and measure as part of the employee experience. Excellent. So then in terms of how we measure this, so we asked several questions on our employee surveys, our 360 surveys. Mm -hmm. I think that dance around the topic, uh, you know, kind of measure it indirectly and more directly. Do you want to talk about some of those? Yeah, let me jump down to those. So some of our items that we use, these are statements that we ask people to respond. And from a measurement perspective, Charles, you have two ways of figuring this out. Mm -hmm. You can measure what we call perceptions, attitudes, and beliefs. So the following 22 statements I'm going to give you, or how many ever I choose to give you, are measuring people's perceptions, attitudes, and beliefs about whether psychological They're, safety exists. Sure. The other way to measure this is to look for the absence or presence of behaviors that drive psychological safety. Yeah. And to be effective, you actually have to do both. So on an org level survey, we'll talk about questions that tell us perceptions, attitudes, and beliefs. But when we run 360s, and the more granular level assessments we do, we start looking for the absence or presence of the behaviors that we know are associated with psychological safety. Yeah. Okay. So let me jump in with some of our perceptions, attitudes, and beliefs, those survey items. Like the people I work with treat me with respect. My supervisor treats people with fairness and respect. I feel that I can speak up without fear of retribution or negative consequences. Mm -hmm. I trust my supervisor. Another few examples, let me give you. Uh, my supervisor is approachable and easy to talk to. I feel free to voice my opinions openly at work. We are encouraged to challenge each other's ideas and present new ideas. Yep. So we can sprinkle into a survey these types of questions and return to the organization and those wanting to do the analysis some pretty good understanding. But as I said, that's part of the picture. The other picture comes from looking at the behaviors associated that create those, right? Mm -hmm. And so those are psychological safety, and I'm going to cover the behaviors with those, collaboration, and then diversity, equity, inclusion. Mm -hmm. Those three competencies with their associated behaviors, I think, are really the core of, of seeing whether it's going to happen. Right. All right, let me hit psychological safety first, okay? Yep. So I can trust this person to represent my interests when I am not around. Demonstrates an awareness of how his or her behavior affects others. Mm -hmm. Treats people with dignity, fairness, and respect. Promotes a culture where all team members feel safe to express their ideas. So again, as organizations sit down and they design their 360 degree feedback assessments for development, we would strongly advise them to insert either this entire competency of psychological safety, but if not, some of these key behaviors, such as promotes a culture where all team members feel safe to express their ideas. Definitely. The other one's collaboration. Here, demonstrates appreciation for the unique differences and perspectives of others, builds and maintains strong working relationships with others, works effectively with individuals at all levels of the organization, facilitates teamwork and communication across functions, divisions, and or departments. So we like to see a sprinkling in of that. And then finally, the diversity, equity, and inclusion behaviors treats everyone fairly regardless of background, seeks and uses input from diverse sources, demonstrates an understanding of how diversity and culture impact the team's success in the workplace, and then demonstrates consistency in how others are treated regardless of personal relationships. So we like to look for those behaviors as well as those other statements that we talked about earlier. That's our strategy in helping our clients understand the level to which psychological safety is present in their teams, their departments, and so on. Yeah, and I can tell you as we have debrief leaders on those questions, especially one about understanding how your behavior impacts others, that's a hard question. So sometimes I see low scores there, and they're surprised by it because they think, oh, well, I, I assumed I'm treating people with respect or I understand how my behavior influences others. But it's, it's kind of an eye-opening experience for them to see that, oh, maybe I'm not as aware as I thought I was. Oh, for sure. That's truly the power of a 360 is those blind spots that we carry with us. Mm -hmm. We don't find those out until someone sits down and says, no, not so fast. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about some work that McKinsey has done in this area. They do a nice little model in which they talk about essentially three areas, four areas, if you will, that are required for diversity equity to thrive, meaning mm -hmm. you need to make sure you're focused on 
supportive and consultative leadership. So those are leaders that demonstrate the behaviors we just talked about. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then they, they threw in a, a secondary element called challenging leadership. And that is a leader who is able to challenge the thinking, the analysis, the work that's being done on their team, but is does so in a respectful and, and appropriate way. Yeah. So in other words, in order for a team to be psychologically safe, the leader has to demonstrate that it's okay to challenge others. It's okay to put things out there. They have to demonstrate that they're not going to punish people. So not only do you have to be supportive, but you need to then model the very behavior you want to draw out from others. Mm -hmm. And then this other area that they talk about, which is senior leader inclusiveness, breaking down silos in leadership. Sometimes as we progress from level to level within the organization, we think we've joined a new locker room and that we can never go back to the place we were. <laughs> and sometimes that's not entirely true, that we can be inclusive. We can reach down and invite others to participate upward. And so they recommend making sure that you focus on senior leader inclusiveness in addition to challenging the team and being supportive of that team in you know making it a safe environment. And that's interesting because it's a tough balance to feel like you're supportive and challenging. Because, you know, I'll debrief some leaders on their 360 report, and they will be the real directive type, the, the, the ones that just tell it like it is, you know, kind of East Coast mentality, so to speak, dealing with maybe a Midwestern or West Coast mentality where, you know, it's more easygoing, so to speak. And they have the toughest time saying, I'm not trying to be combative or I'm not trying to be, you know, authoritative, but people take me the wrong way. I'm just trying to discuss an issue. So the, the topic is really how you frame it, how you make sure this word safety is always kind of included in, in that, that ex exchange. Well, let's take your example because it's, it's one we come across all the time. Mm -hmm. An effective leader has someone like that on their team. They cherish that person. Yeah. They let them go, but then they're, they're careful to stop them, invite another person to join the conversation. Yeah say, look, this isn't the only way we're going to think about this. You need that leader to sort of be a facilitator right. of that hard charging, you know, Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> right. Native. Tell like it is. Uh -huh. It's yeah. not bad to tell like it is, but you have to have someone facilitate that for others so you can draw from them their thoughts and perceptions about how things should work. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of about tempering it a bit and also checking in and saying, okay, that's how I feel. How do you feel? So mm -hmm. let me, let me, I'm not trying to shut the, the discussion yeah. down. Yeah. So Edmondson has seven reflective questions that she put out that you could ask yourself or a team mm -hmm. and see whether you feel like it's indicative of whether you've got the right levels of psychological safety. So let's go through these together. If you make a mistake on the team, it is often held against you. Mm. If you're agreeing, good question. Or agreeing to that, <laughs> we've got a problem. Yeah. Number two, members of this team are able to bring up problems and tough issues. You know, hopefully we're agreeing or strongly agreeing with that. People on this team sometimes reject others for being different. It is safe to take a risk on this team. It is difficult to ask other members of this team for help. I like that one in particular because you're not asking anybody to evaluate others. You just say, how hard is it to get help? Uh -huh. And if it's hard, you have a sense then that something's going on. Mm -hmm. No one on this team would deliberately act in a way that undermines my efforts. And working with members of this team, my unique skills and talents are valued and utilized. Mm. I really liked these seven. I thought they were well-framed. Yeah. And I think it's just something... You jot these down. We'll probably do an infographic maybe here of some of these to put out here in a, a few weeks where you can do this as a self-evaluation to, to see whether psychological safety is present in your team. All right. I wanted to kind of conclude, Charles, with just some recommendations. Sure. So number one, I believe that this is a team-driven leadership challenge. So some of the things we address in when we consult with organizations, they're entirely about organizational structures. There may be about things that HR can do, but this is one that's all about the team. Yep. You don't really build psychological safety anywhere but the team. So understanding that, then we need to train our leaders. We need to help leaders understand that they're responsible for psychological safety and that the primary place it's built at the team. Because you can have 
a leader get up and, and have these generalizations and sweeping statements and it won't really matter. Yeah. Right. You and I can be in a company meeting and the president can get up and have this great message about how it's safe to be yourself. But if you go back and make a mistake and you're just lit up for it. <laughs> right. And it doesn't have to be you. It could be someone else yeah. you heard about. Well, you're like, I'm not taking that yeah. risk. Right. So again, HR leaders, you need to need to drive the point home, team driven the challenge. Interestingly, I don't think it's enough just to say, well, now I've identified the behaviors of, of what psychological safety is. So that's it. I just need to have more of those characteristics. Yeah. I think you have to have more of a system as well. And that was what your point was. When you're talking about a leader who knows how to guide a discussion, who has a checklist of making sure that they've included everyone in deliberations. Yeah. So it's not enough to say, well, I'm a psychologically safe person and I have those characteristics. You also have to have a system for implementing that within your team. So it's, it's a blend of trait centered leadership as well as you better have a model how you're going to do it. Sure. And then drive out fear. I can't get past how much that resonated with me with Deming. If I had one message, drive out the fear out of your team. Make it a place where people can perform. Now, doesn't mean we're not, we don't hold people accountable, but we drive out fear. I don't know if you've experienced this, but fear is just the ultimate saboteur of relationships, of good feelings. Trust. Of tr- it just it gums up everything. It increases friction. So drive out fear. And, th- and this is really talking to one of the topics around autonomy, right? Empowering people. Mm-hmm. So if you're trying to create that on your team, which drives tons of innovation and, and, and engagement, this is what kills it, right? Yeah. So this is what is the, the opposite. So the antidote, in my view, is kindness and empathy. We've heard a lot about that during COVID-19, mm-hmm. about the power of empathetic leaders. But just be kind. And if you can just be kind and empathetic, you've gone a long way to driving out fear. Yeah. Love this quote by Leo Tolstoy. You should know that when a message you convey to another person is not understood by him, at least one of the following things is true. One, what you have said is not true, or you have conveyed it without kindness. Hmm. The point he's making is that if you convey messages without kindness, it will distort the message. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you say. So in other words, if you want the message just to be decide whether it's true or false, it better be delivered with kindness. Yeah. I thought that was a powerful reflection. And as a leader, I really think we want to make sure that we're delivering our messages with kindness so that we're dealing with the truth of the matter, not all the stuff around it. Great points. Well, Matt, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today on our Engaging People podcast. We hope you join us on a future episode. Yep. Thanks. Thanks.